weeks. I thought it was last week, but he said two weeks there's a hurricane coming. He knew. But um, in this world, we want to have a strong, healthy life because in this world, nothing seems to last. Am I right? seems like nothing lasts like it used to last. If I asked you how long your new refrigerator is going to last, you would tell me one day past the warranty. <laughs> this is how good science has become. Am I right? I mean, they figured this thing out to the day. It's planned obsolescence or planned destruction. Things will fall apart by plan. Everything seems to eventually collapse around us. Nations rise, then they fall. Companies grow up strong, and then they fall apart. Hurricanes show us that even great houses can come crashing down and swept away with the forces of water. But lives, too, can be strong and fall apart. Famous people, celebrities, we see them all the time. They look, man, they're going great. And the next season, they're falling apart, and they're in despair. And we all know lives that looks solid on the outside, that looks solid, a marriage or a life or a family for a season, and then suddenly, they crash. Suddenly, they go down. And then later, we find out that there there was something at the root that wasn't quite right. There was something missing in the foundation of the building or in the life. And it wasn't built on something solid. But that doesn't come out till later. So when the storms come crashing in on life, they crumble under the pressure. But God doesn't want our lives to crumble in the storms of life. God doesn't want our lives to sink into the sands of despair and heartache as we wonder what went wrong. What is happening? What went wrong with my life? God wants us to have a strong Life. He wants our lives and he wants this church to be strong and healthy and built on something solid. Last week we talked about planning your lives in the living word of God. Today we're going to talk about building your lives on the living stone of Jesus Christ. Where the tests of life, the storms of each season can come at you. Even evil attacks can come at you and they won't shake you. They'll just strengthen you. In Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to hear from you, an opportunity to be challenged by you, to be different than those around us, to be built on something more solid than the things we see in this world, the things we aspire to in our hearts. Lord, we ask that you speak to us, challenge us, strengthen us to take steps forward. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you have your notes or you need notes, raise your hand. Bibles, love if you'd have a Bible. I know we get used to the scrolling thing. I still like the old, old, old paper route, paper Bibles, papyri. That's how old I am, the scrolls. Pull those out to 1 Peter chapter 2 because God's building a house. I'm going to give you a quick recap of two weeks ago. Chapter 2, verse 2, Peter says this, Like newborn babies... Crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. We mentioned that God's whole goal for us in all of this and what he's doing in your life through Jesus Christ, his whole goal is to grow you up in your salvation in Christ. In other words, don't stay babies. He doesn't want you to stay babies in Jesus. How many think babies are cute? Like babies? Oh, they're so cute. We got a little granddaughter, a little baby. She's so cute. How many would want that baby to be a two-year-old the rest of their lives? I mean, you want to finally get some sleep. You don't want them teething for 20 years. Amen? And so this is what Peter's saying through the Scripture, saying, look, God's whole design in this isn't that you get saved and stay there. It's that you grow up, you mature up in your salvation. We grow up by being nurtured in the living word of God, we said. Do you remember how many times a week we said it would take for you to actually change things in your life? How many times would you have to read the Bible in a week for transformation to start to happen? Do you remember? Four times a week. Make it a regular practice That's four over three, just four times. Tip the scale to four times a week, and you will see miraculous transformation in your life. Now, how many did that this last two weeks? Look at that, man. Woo! Come on, give it up. That was like a lame applause. Give it up. 
man, I'm just telling you, if we can get believers to read the scripture four times a week on a regular basis, we're going to grow up in a mature body of Christ, and we're going to make an impact in this world. That's how we grow up. That's how we grow up in our salvation. But the second way we grow up is found in this next passage. This next passage sounds kind of complicated, complex. Don't worry, I'm going to break it down, and Peter's going to show us the second leg of how to grow us up in a mature faith in Jesus Christ. Start in verse 4 of chapter 2, 1 Peter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, believers, as you come to Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built, say being built, into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, Peter is using the language of a builder, and he's referring to God as the master builder. Because as much as we like to build things on earth, Peter knows this, God knows this, we like to build things ever since we had Legos, you know, or a tree fort, or you name it, or build anything, build a business. God loves to build too. And God is the master builder. He's building something way better than we can build here on earth. God's building a living house in his kingdom. God's building a living house right before us. He's constructing a spiritual house out of you and me, out of our lives. In other words, God and all he's done through Jesus Christ for our salvation was doing way more than just saving you so you won't go to hell. He's doing way more than that. How many agree with that? It's not just about, hey, at least I'm getting out of hell free card, and I'm ready, good to go. He's building us, you and me, up into this spiritual spiritual temple, this spiritual house. He's a builder, and he's building something amazing, spectacular, eternal with us. God's a builder, and he sees us as worthy materials to build his spiritual house. Turn to your neighbor and say You're a worthy material. I don't think you believed him. God chooses to use us, and he's the great builder, and he's including us. But we have to wrap our mind around this. He's different than an earthly builder. Amen? We earthly builders use wood or cement or hay or whatever we any thatch or anything else. We use things that are kind of dead. There's no life to them. Like everything else in this world, it's just kind of dead. It's just inanimate. But God uses only living things for his living house. And the first thing you need to know about us and God building is that Jesus is our living stone. Jesus is our living stone. That word stone there from the Greek refers to the big masonry blocks that they would chisel out of the granite slabs or the big cliffs. They'd chisel them out into big squares. He's a living stone. He's like this big concrete or granite slab. God doesn't use weak things that are going to blow away. He uses strong things. He uses a rock. Do you know how many times God is referred to as a rock in the Bible? He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my Man, he's always being referred to as this massive foundational rock that we can stand on. But just not just the rock of ages, not just any old rock. God's refer, referring to a living rock here. Rocks are usually, you know, like stones are usually referred to something being dead. Like if you're out and you're stone dead, right? You're like a rock, he's, he's, he's done. But in this term, he's looking at Jesus and saying, no, he's not that kind of rock. He's a living rock. He's a living stone. God is using something alive to build. Jesus is the resurrected ones, the ones that humans rejected first. The ones that humans looked at Jesus as master builders and said, is this rock, is this a great foundation for us to build something on, build our lives on, build a religion on, build a nation on? And they looked at him and said, you are not worthy for us. You're not like us, you don't build like us, and therefore, they killed him. But God chose him 
And then God the Father rose him from the dead so that he could build his spiritual house right on top of it. He's a living rock. Because he's a living rock, this building is going to be alive. Jesus is the living stone. That word live, that phrase living stone doesn't just mean a stone that's alive. In the Greek, it's a genitive of, of source. You don't have to remember that. But source, you can remember. He's a stone that gives life. Not just a living stone. He's a stone that life comes out of. Does that make sense? There's a difference in that. He is the one that gives life. He's the only one that gives life. Jesus is the life giver for those who would believe in him. That's why Peter says, we also, you and me here at Life Coast, are like living stones and we're being built up into a spiritual house. See, in God's plan, when we believe in Jesus as our Savior, God takes us, the ones who were dead, as Paul says in Ephesians, dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses, and through Jesus makes us alive in Christ. That's his plan, to make us alive. And what he does is he, he places us on and in Jesus, the living stone, the life giver, and makes us alive when we're connected to Jesus. What does that tell you about how important it is to be connected to Jesus, the life giver? He is where, the only place you're going to find any life for this world. You're to be built on this living stone, this living rock. Not on dead things. You never plant your life on dead things. Everything besides Jesus gives you death. You have been made alive. Your connection is Jesus, is with Jesus. And you get life from him. And Peter sneaks a little warning in here when he says this. We are being built. Being built into a spiritual house. In other words, God's the builder. That's a passive statement. You are not to be building anything. He's building. You are being built. When you surrender to Christ, when you surrender to his work, he is going to build you into something. The problem is, we like to get our mitts all over the work, all over our lives, am I right? We like to decide, well, let me lend a hand here, Jesus. And we like to work it and sand it and tweak it and make it, manipulate it, massage it, make it right. And what happens is we get disconnected from the living stone and we produce death. That's catastrophic for us. God wants to do the work in you. And Peter's telling you, get your hands off. Let him do the work. He's got life for you. Stop trying to build and connect to anything else in life. See, you may made alive. Your connection is with Jesus. He's the living stone of our spiritual house. Number two, Jesus is our cornerstone. Our cornerstone. With all this talk about building a life and a church, Peter throws this thought about a cornerstone. Because if you're going to build anything, you have to know where to start. Any builders in here? You can't just throw things down. i got to know where to start. i got to have my starting point. i got to have level ground. You have to know where to start. And Peter says, you got to have a cornerstone. He says in verse 6, For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion. This is this heavenly, perfect city God's building. A chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Peter mentions the stone, this rock, this cornerstone six times in the passage. How many think that's important? You'll slow down and say, what's really happening here? Six times he's mentioning it's a key concept. See, in the ancient world, the primary building, as I said, was this big masonry stone. But there was one that was different, one that was larger, one that was straighter, one that might even had an edge, a 90 degree to it. And no matter how hard the wind blows, when you build things on top of that, things won't topple because a cornerstone sets the direction and the angle 
and actually creates the foundation for the weight. If you ever build anything without a starting point or a cornerstone, you find out soon enough you get in trouble. I built a tree fort when I was a kid. I know nothing about building, and I still only know about this much. And then I married a Holly, whose father was a master builder. So uh, I pretty much found out I don't know anything about building. So I'd watch. And that remind, reminded me of, of a tree house I built when I was about 13 years old. And I just throw down some old wood I found in the woods, kind of rotten and stuff like that. Just kind of built one wall like this. And then I built one wall. I started building up. And I just kind of leaned them against each other and put a little strap. And wouldn't you know, I thought, you know, I'm gonna, this is going to be fun. I'm playing in the tree house. And one day after school, maybe about a week later, I went there. And then it's toppled over. Just toppled over. My buddy says, well, you build it on soft dirt with rotten wood, and the walls look like this, not like this, and no wonder that's what's going to happen. And Peter's saying, that's how our lives can look if we don't use a cornerstone. A cornerstone. A cornerstone sets the direction and the angles and the foundation for the weight so you can build up. And then no matter how hard the wind blows and the storms come in, it's going to stand tall and firm because it's built on a trusted cornerstone. Now, what happens, again, if the cornerstone is crooked? Or what happens when the cornerstone's weak and fragile and frail? When the storm winds come, when grounds shift, you see, you've seen it on the news, you've seen pictures where buildings don't last. Big, strong, high-rise buildings come tumbling down right before us. It's not because the storm was so strong. It's because the foundation and the cornerstone was weak and it wasn't built properly. So Peter calls Jesus the cornerstone that all of life is supposed to be built on. I remember uh, you probably saw the picture, maybe the one before this. I took a couple of my kids to Jerusalem. We saw the Great Wall and the Great Temple Mount, and a lot of it's knocked down, but it goes well deep into the ground, and you can walk around uh, down into this pit and do a tour below the, the great wall of the temple of Jerusalem. And there is a cornerstone down there. And this cornerstone, this gentleman here is the tour guide, is 40 feet long and 15 feet high and weighs 40 tons. How many pounds is that? Eight thousands of pounds right next to that guy. And you can see it, it lines that whole cavern. 2,000 years ago, that was laid. As much as those wanted to come and topple the temple, they couldn't topple anything that was directly on the cornerstone because it was so solid. We are to build our lives on the cornerstone of Jesus. But we have lots of options in this life, don't we? We've got a lot of options to build our lives on. A lot of things we can chase after. A lot of big dreams. A lot of big goals that we can chase after. I'm going to ask my friend Pat to come on up here and help me today. Pat, uh, give it up for Pat. <laughs> Pat's our graphic arts guy, does all these slides. He's our hero, makes anything kind of confusing look more clear, so we thank you for that. Um, but also, I'm using Pat for two reasons. Number one, I tweaked my back yesterday, and I can't lift and write anything down here, so I'm going to make him do that. Number two, I'm using these boxes because my family just moved in a new house, and they need to get rid of boxes. So I said, I'll bring them to church and get them out of their garage. So this is what we're going to do today. Pat, what you're going to do is take this pen, and you're going to write on these boxes what these great people say we, we can build our lives upon. Okay? What are, okay, so I wrote a few on there just so you know what boxes can finally match. So what you're going to do is tell Pat what are the things in this world that we can build our lives on or that we can chase after for a dream? What are some things? Say it. Say Love. Okay, but don't be so Christian. I said, in this world. He aces Bible trivia every time. Jesus. Career. Job. Okay, I like that. Uh, money. Big dollar sign. Influence or status, I like that. Be insta-famous. Who wants to be insta-famous or YouTube famous? Status, say it again. Power, nice. Position, power, success. 
Louder. Stuff. Stuff. Possessions, stuff, junk, things that looked important, then they end up in your garage the next year. Knowledge, okay. How about, not, not so much in but how about family? Yeah, some things could be good things. Family. How many want to be married? Or like, if I could just get married, my life's going to be complete. Married? How many, like, if I could just have kids, that would be it. I mean, those are all good things, but they're things we can try to build our life around, build our life upon. Anything else? Sports? Hobbies? Fun? Cruises? If I could just do two cruises a year, life would be A-OK, right? We have so many options, and most of them are before us as physical examples, right before us, like celebrities, famous people living these things out with their success or financial things. You know, you got financial gurus. If you do this, invest in that, get that Bitcoin, crypto, you know, NFTR, TRG, whatever those are, and you get some of those deals going on. That's the ticket, baby. And you throw us everything, and everything just draws us. If, and we start thinking, if I could just be like this guy who has this job, or this guru has this bank account, if I could be like this family who's got those kids, my kids, those kids would be, I got to have those things and be instant famous, and that kind of knowledge, if I could just be that or be like that person, everything would be great, and you start thrusting all your energy, your time, and your focus on that thing or those things. And you think, okay, so maybe I got the wrong cornerstone. The problem is, these are not the cornerstones. These are the desires of our heart on earth. You know who the cornerstone is? Hey, why don't you go behind here and just pick this thing up, Pat? Pat's going to Show us his strength. He's been working out. That is life. Right? That is life. And it can get heavy, right? It can get kind of crazy. And you then are the cornerstone. Pat, I want you to just set that box, that whole life down, and just see what happens when you are the cornerstone of all the things you aspire to in this life. There are three types of people in this room. Stay there, Pat. You're going to do that again. There are those who don't know Jesus as Savior. You're not yet a believer. And so you have this life, and everything going on, you're trying to make it work. And you're here, and you've been hearing about Jesus, but he's over here. And you're thinking maybe if I hear a little bit about Jesus, it'll help me over here. I'll try to apply some things. But you are still the cornerstone of your life. And eventually it's all going to crumble. Eventually it's going to come down. It doesn't matter if you've been coming to church consistently once a month, Christmas and Easter. We call them priesters. It's not going to help this problem out. Am I right? Now, there are others in here. Pat, lift up your life again. who have received Jesus as Savior, and you've just added him to your life. And by adding him to your life, you figured, well, now life can go better. And so you just got Jesus next to you. And what your thought is, is that if Jesus can come into my life, he can help me with my life. He can bless my life. He can make sure that I'm healthy. He can make sure I have kids, have that spouse. He can make sure I'm going to live my best life now, and he's going to make sure life is better. And I'm going to show the world that as long as I have Jesus next to me, life is better. The problem is, Pat, when you lay your entire weighted life down on you, and Jesus is still smaller than you, because you're the cornerstone, has anything really changed? Because eventually, this is going to happen. And it doesn't matter how consistent you are. It doesn't matter how many friends you might have. If you have not made Jesus the anchor, it's all going to come crumbling down. And what's going to happen is, it's going to leave you disappointed and doubting that Jesus loved you at all. Because I thought I was doing the right thing by getting Jesus in my life, and it's still falling apart just like my neighbor 
maybe he doesn't love me after all. Maybe something's wrong with me, or maybe something's wrong with him, and he's not the Lord. And eventually you'll have a crisis. But then the third person is the one Peter is asking us to be. That's the person who says, you know what? I'm going to build my life on Jesus Christ alone, my cornerstone. Pat, pick up your heavy life. You got a lot going on here, Pat. Now just see what happens when you put him over here on the cornerstone of life. That just seems like it's solid. That seems like you can have things in your life, but they won't become the God of your life. They won't become overconsumed with your life. They're going to be built on Jesus who makes sense of these things in your life. That gives you better perspective of these things in your life. And he gets to be desired and to use these things in your life for his glory. And when you set your life and build it on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, the storms may come, the winds may blow, but Jesus Christ will never fail. And this is the kind of life we're called to have. Give it up for Pat. Everything that isn't built on Jesus Christ will crumble. Everything built on something other than Jesus Christ will crumble. I said it both ways so you get it. Everything eventually crumbles without Jesus. Your life will crumble without Jesus. Marriages crumble without Jesus. Families eventually crumble without Jesus. Businesses crumble without Jesus. Everything crumbles when it's not built on Jesus. Economics, nations, constitutions, leaders, marriages, and families all fall apart without Jesus eventually. Because the storms come for every single one of us. But the only things built on Jesus will stand like a spiritual house. The answer to all our problems start with Jesus. You say, Pastor, I... I'm having a relationship issue. What's the answer? Start with Jesus. Career issues? Start with Jesus. I got a financial crisis. I got a marriage crisis. Listen, don't start with self-help books. Don't start with counseling. Don't start with chat rooms, support rooms on Google, TikTok, BlickBlock, whatever those things are. Don't start with counselors. Start with Jesus. Jesus. Get up in the morning, open the living word, and build that marriage on Jesus. Do things like Jesus. Love like Jesus. See that spouse like Jesus. Your kids like Jesus. Then see what happens. Get up in the morning, open the living word, and go be an employee like Jesus. A friend like Jesus. It's the best go-to solution I have for you, period. Because it's the only one that really works. He's the one that created you, he saved you, and he's building something in you. He began a good work in you, he wants to finish that work in you. You might as well start with Jesus for once instead of all the things you desire. Is that pointed enough? I have no other answer. And if you want to be a good friend and family member in the body of Christ, give this same advice. Don't just say, I feel bad, brother, for your situation. I'm going to just start praying for you. Say, open the word of God and build that thing on Jesus. He will guide you. He will direct you. Make him your cornerstone. Even if he says, take some things out so we can start over, start it on Jesus. Tell each other that so we grow up into a strong, spiritual, mature house of God. It's to be built on Jesus alone. Run everything by Jesus. Make every decision based on Jesus. Determine once and all, once for all, you're going to build your life on Jesus. And then Peter offers a promise. Verse 7 says, The one who trusts in the cornerstone will never be put to shame. When you live your life like this, And I'm not saying it's easy. We're tempted, we're pulled, we're compelled. Things look great, they look shiny. 
He says, when you build your life on Jesus, you'll never be ashamed. You'll never be humiliated, and you'll never look back and regret anything you've done. Because you built your whole life on Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. And the last one is, Jesus is our precious stone. Two times, Peter says in this passage, Jesus is the precious stone to the Father. That word precious means priceless, invaluable. I don't know what you have in your life that you consider priceless, but to to the Father, Jesus was priceless, invaluable. He's more valuable than any gold, any jewel. To the Father, he is immeasurably valuable. He's highly loved, he said. He's so much more than anything in creation. Jesus is incredible in beauty. His glory is amazing. His magnificent, incredible. He's brilliant. He's holy. And he's the epitome of love. He is love. And the Father really, really, really loves Jesus. Now, I know he loves you, he told me. But he really loves Jesus. He says... After being baptized, this is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. He really loves Jesus. Now Peter says, now to you and me who believe this stone is precious too. Is Jesus that precious to us? Do we consider him immeasurable in value? Do we consider him magnificent above all things? Is he invaluable to us? Is he above all things in our life? He should be if we're a Christian. I heard John MacArthur say once, an older preacher who I listened to in the 80s a lot, this really meant a lot to my spiritual life, but he was asked once way back when, how could you know truly if someone was a Christian? How can you tell if somebody truly is saved? And the options were given. Now, they could say a prayer to receive Jesus. That's one way. He said, hey, John, he could also get baptized. Maybe they came down and confessed their sins before Christ. How do you tell if they are a true believer? And John said, well, I guess none of those things would truly tell me that because only God knows the heart. But I can tell you this. To a true believer, Christ is precious. They love Christ with their whole heart. And they can't get enough of him. He's all in all. He's everything. Jesus says in 840, John 842, if God were your father, you would love me. If you belong to me, you would love me. In the first chapter of 1 Peter, he says, though you have not seen him yet, believers, you love him. With all your weaknesses, with all our failures, we are marked by one thing, loving Jesus Christ. We can't get enough of Jesus Christ. We can't get enough of his beauty, his glory, his miracles, his love, his presence when you're a true believer. That's why we read the Bible, because when we go in there, we're, it's revealing Jesus, and we want more of him. We want to know him more. That's why we go to him in prayer, so we can be intimate with Jesus, converse with Jesus, hear him, have him guide us and direct us, make us more like him. That's why Christ is the topic of our conversations, or should be the main topic of our conversations. That's why the books we read should be about Jesus, because he's all in all. He's our cornerstone. We can't get enough of his beauty, his glory, his holiness. He's the pearl of heaven. He's the lamb of God. He's the prince of peace. He's Jesus. And there's power in the name of Jesus and the presence of Jesus Christ. He created everything, including me, and he's just simply more precious than I could ever explain. But my question to you, I'm going to ask the same question I asked of me yesterday morning when I'm walking through this. If we look at our lives, if you look at your behaviors, your thoughts, our posts, would others say that what they notice about us is that Jesus is precious and that we love him so? Is he the most thing on our minds and in our hearts in our conversations? Is he that precious? I'm skipping the last point because I feel God's saying he's working in some hearts today. Come to Word on Wednesday. We'll go over the last point. You can read ahead. It just basically says God is building a spiritual temple so we can be a light to the nations, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his possession, 
we are so secure in Jesus Christ. He's building us up to be an amazing example to the world around us so they might come and know Jesus Christ. That's a great purpose, amen? It's a great purpose for a church. But before we talk about that, God has a question for us. Where do you stand with Jesus? The living stone. The Savior. What have you been building your life on? Which one of these three are you? Maybe you've come for a while and you don't really know that Jesus is your Savior. You haven't received him and committed your life to him, but he's over here. But meanwhile, your life is getting heavy. There's people in this very room where life has crumbled all around them. And they're seeking an answer. And if you don't have Jesus... As Savior, is going to keep crumbling and falling apart. Because the one who created you, loved you, died for you, wants to come up underneath you and be your anchor. He wants to forgive you of all those things, all those sins, and shore you up into a saint of God. Maybe you're here in the middle, like I find myself in many seasons. Where you've received Christ, you know he's a Savior, you can even... Raise your hands and worship him. But if you're really honest and you look at your life, he's really just next to you. And while you're working your life and while you're making decisions, while you're running this way, that way, this career, this relationship, try to get that marriage going, that get these kids raised up without hurting each other and the world around them. And Jesus is like, can you let me take over? Like, no, Jesus, just keep blessing what I'm doing. Jesus, keep... Keep blessing me. I'm having problems, Jesus. Can you fix it? And Jesus says, I can fix it. But it all has to be on me. And it's time to move away and get on me. And we all go through seasons like that. And many of you could be in that season now where you're facing some crumbling, some toppling. The world has been crazy jobs, finances, raising kids. It's just a crazy place and you feel it toppling around you and you thought you could stand up. You thought you'd been working out in life enough and it's falling around you. And you don't know where to go because Jesus isn't doing what he's supposed to do according to you. Maybe today that's your challenge to take a stand and say, I am no longer going to be my anchor. Jesus hasn't been precious enough to be my living stone. Today, I need to move out of the way and get a new foundation. I don't want to live the rest of my life without Jesus as the cornerstone and continually have life fall apart on me. I don't know what the next few years hold, but I'm telling you, it doesn't seem like it's going to get any better. Am I the only one? Life's going to come down around all of us. Storms are going to hit. Winds are going to blow. And as your pastor and the one who loves you here at Life Coast Church, I'm just going to say, I want you to be a strong, firm life, marriage, family, business, employee, in a world that's falling apart. It's only going to happen if Jesus is at the cornerstone. Why don't we all stand? We're going to pray. So bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're here today and you have never made Jesus that cornerstone, received him as your savior. And you know now that this is why life falls apart. And you'd like him to be your savior today, just raise your hand, slip it up. This would be the day. This would be the day. Amen, amen. Just slip it up, say, I am tired of life falling apart. Jesus, you need to take my life. Be my savior. Anyone else? Anyone else? Amen. Now, if you're here today and you face some storms in life and now you understand it's because you've been doing life, you've been the cornerstone, 
and you want to move out of the way so that the precious stone can be your cornerstone, just slip your hand up. But this would be the day. We pray for you. Amen. This would be the day Jesus takes my life. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this time with you.